good morning. Hey, I'm Ovella, and uh, Mark and a team is over in India right now. So be sure to uh, be keeping them in their prayers as they are over there ministering some to some pastors um, this week. So um, anyway, um, today I thought I would kind of continue on with um, some of what uh, Philip spoke about last week as he talked about how much God loves us. Um, one of the statements he made last week that really like stuck with me was that there's nothing we can do that will make God love us more, and there's nothing we can do that, that will make God love us less. And, and that's the great thing about our Father's love is that He's eager to lavish His love on us. Um, I wanted to read 1 John 3, 1 out of the Passion Translation, and it says, Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that He has lavished on us. He has called us and made us His very own beloved children. The reason the world doesn't recognize who we are is that they didn't recognize Him. I just love that. You know, at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that He has lavished on us. I mean, He's just waiting to lavish that love on us. And I mean, I think most of us will probably know John three sixteen and um, just to paraphrase it, you know, that he loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us. That's just such a sacrificial love that I personally can't even imagine. I mean, I love my my kiddos so much. I just can't imagine, you know, like that, that sacrifice to sacrifice one of my kids. And um, but I just, you know, he just truly, truly loves us. So, you know, that's kind of what Philip talked about last week. And so, you know, it pushed me to the next question then. So what is it that keeps us from experiencing his love? Um, the father never withholds that love, but sometimes we don't experience it. And so if he doesn't withhold it, then it's probably something on our side. And I think, you know, sometimes we put obstacles in our way that blocks his love. Um, and then I think sometimes we just ignore the fact that we need it. I think especially in our culture, you know, our, our needs can sometimes be met by ourselves. So we will often just not even feel the need to um, seek his love. Um, so I wanna, I'm going to kind of start in Matthew 22, 37 through 39. And I want to first read out of um, ESV. So if you want to join me. With that, it's Matthew 22, 37 through 39. Um, and that says, and he said to, to him, and this is, he's speaking to the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees here. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And of these two commandments depend on the law of the prophets. Well, that was 40 also. Sorry, I threw that in there. So, um, you know, I always like to, to look in their Greek, or the original language just happens to be Greek, um, to see what the, the choral words mean. And, I mean, none of these are really shockers, but I did look, in, look it up. And, like, to love here is to be fond of or love dearly. Heart is the center of spiritual life, is to desire, passion, affection. Soul is that which makes the flesh come alive, desire. Um, as a matter of fact, um, then I went to read it in the Passion, which I do. When I'm studying, I usually will look in the ES, ESV or the NIV, I mean, ESV or the NIV, but then a lot of times I'll go to the Passion just to kind of give me a different flavor. And when I went to um, the Passion, version. It had a lot of that same language in here. So I do want to read it out of that because I thought that was pretty interesting. So same scripture out of the Passion. It says, Jesus answered him, love the Lord your God with every passion of your heart, with all the energy of your being, with every thought that is within you. This is the great and supreme commandment. And the second is like an importance. You must love your friend in the same way you love yourself. I love that. I mean, it's like all the 100% words, like with every passion, with all the energy. With I mean, there's a lot of 100% words here. Like he's talking 100% of yourself. 
And the thing about this is that this is a command. This is not like, a suggestion. This is an action verb. This requires action from us. We, this is, you know, it's not kind of like whatever. This is a command that we are told to love the Lord God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. So if the Father is always lavishing his love on us, and we are commanded to always love him, then we should always be experiencing his love, right? I mean, like if he's there waiting to lavish his love, we're always approaching him, loving him, then we're just great. That should be the case. But I don't know about you. Um, if I'm being honest, I can't say that I live there. Um, I wish I did, but I don't. So there's a disconnect somewhere. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, so, you know, why is a, there a disconnect? Where is the disconnect? Um, and, how, you know, maybe how can we get past that disconnect? Um, so I think that's, that's, that's really important. So um, have you ever heard the phrase, um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink? Um, you know, I was kind of thinking about that because, you know, like we can, we can be led to the Father but unless we partake of what he has for us, then we're just standing there. Or sometimes we might get really close, but there's this wall in front of us, so we can't receive it because we've put this wall up. He's never going to put a wall in front of us. We're the one that puts the wall up. We're the one that lays the brick in front of us. Or maybe we don't even approach him. That could be the case also. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of evaluate what it is that's keeping us from experiencing his love um, and it can be a lot of things and I'm just going to touch on a few of them today um, and then maybe at the end of gather group we can take a few minutes to kind of look and see um, if any of those things pertain to your life so um, one of the things that I think keeps us from experiencing the father's love is um, hurts like we've had a past hurt and that has caused us to harden our heart and that hurt could be from a parent from a child from a spouse from some from another believer um, a church hurt and I will say I think those are really really difficult and and I think that's because we have a different expectation for a believer right because they know Christ we expect them to act Christ-like, right? Because that's what they are. They're Christians, so we expect them to act Christ-like. And when they don't, we get very disappointed, very hurt. And I think a lot of times what happens, though, is then we attribute what they did to God, and we blame God for what the person did. And I think we've got to be very careful with that. Like, we we got to, you know, step back and go, okay, this was the person, not God, and not blame God for what the person did. But a lot of times what we do is when we've been hurt, we take that brick and we put it in front of us and we build that wall. Oh, wow, there's a hurt. I'm not going to, I'm not going to approach God right there because I've been hurt here and I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to be hurt like that again. So here's my brick to protect myself. It's a coping mechanism. going to protect myself. Here's my brick. I've been hurt over here by my father. He wasn't nice to me. I'm going to put a brick right here. There's another one. Keep myself. Oh, he's supposed. To, God's supposed to be my father. Well, my dad wasn't. You know, my dad was nice. I'm not saying that, but a lot of people didn't have that luxury of having a, a great dad. And so, because of that, I want to put a bit brick here to protect myself. The thing is, our heavenly Father's not that way, and we keep putting attributes on him that are not his attributes. So I think we have to be, you know, step back and read his word and see what the truth is about him. And then we don't have to put those bricks up that we often do. So, you know, we have to keep our hearts soft and pliable. And the quicker we can um, deal with those hurts, you know, the less likely we are to have um, those places in our heart to get hardened and for bitterness to root in. 
Um, another place I think that can cause us from experiencing God's love is that we listen to the voices of the world or even ourselves, like we just listen to ourselves. You know, the vo voices of the world will tell us, you know, this is okay and that's okay and, you know, you don't have to do this. And if you've talked to me any time in the net last year, I think the biggest thing that like drives me crazy um, is this, the new um, like adage of my truth. This is my truth. Well, I can just tell you right now, there's the truth. And if your truth lines up with this, then your truth is right. But if your truth doesn't line up with this, then you're gonna end up on a path that does not lead to wholeness and you're gonna end up with a whole lot of bricks built up because you're gonna get frustrated because your truth doesn't line up with here, so you're gonna get frustrated and you're gonna build a brick up between you and God, and you're not gonna experience His love. So, yes, you might think this is right over here because it, it lines up with what you want to be right, but if it doesn't agree with Scripture, then you need to take it back to the Word and say, okay, the culture says this, but scripture says this. So I've got to line up with scripture because that's the truth. And if you do that, you're not going to have a need to put a brick there because you're aligning with the Father. So, you know, just take it back to scripture. It's pretty simple. And when you do that, your truth will be the truth. And so, anyway, that's a that's a message for another day, but it is something that's really, you know, I, I think it is something that's very deep in my heart because I think so many people are getting, you know, on paths that are um, not healthy or, 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 I mean, basically patterns of sin because they don't know what the truth is anymore. And there is just one truth. There's not a variety of truths. It's not, we're not going to go down the grocery store and pick, you know, truths from the shelves. There's just one. So anyway. That's one way. Um, being self-sufficient um, or just prideful um, can keep us from experiencing God's love. We just don't need it. We don't even approach it. Going back to the, uh, the horse analogy, we just don't even need water. We don't need to go to the trough. There's no need to go, so I'm good. I can take care of myself. I don't need his love. I'm, I'm good. Um, so that's one thing. Um, Sometimes we just simply stop investing in uh, the relationship. Um, and that kind of goes along with the self-sufficient. Um, we just either don't see a need in it, we're distracted. Um, I've never really experienced that love before, so why do I need it now in my life? Um, but I can tell you, uh, you know, Mark and I have been married a long time. He could tell you the years, I always get it wrong, so I won't even say it. But um, there's been seasons in our life when I probably haven't been really good at investing in our marriage. And in those seasons, we were, you know, we were stagnant. Uh, there wasn't a lot of joy. Um, I, he, I'm not saying he didn't still like lavish love on me, but because I wasn't, you know, investing back in that, into it at, at that same level, it's really hard to be cohesive. Um, and so at those points, you know, you're just like running against, swimming upstream. And so, you know, it's much better when we're both um, going, you know, going towards each other. And so back with that, it's the same thing. Like if I am approaching the Father, loving the Father, like it says in Matthew, and He is lavishing love on us, then there's joy and then there's love and there's just this abounding peace and all the things that, you know, that he promises in us in as a word. And, and there's no story, there's no stagnant, there's growth. And I mean, that's part of it too. Like you have this growth, you have this joy and you're, and it's wonderful. So um, anyway, so those are things that can kind of help, you know, stop us from experiencing it. So, you know, when we close our heart to God's love, um, we need to be able to kind of look at our lives and see what it is. And there's other things that can kind of, that can cause that, like by living by the world's standards. And um, 
instead of God's. And I know that sometimes those standards look more appealing on the outside. Like it may look more appealing to live in the world sometimes. But I can tell you um, that it's not. Uh, sometimes, you know, you feel like you're losing a freedom by living according to the word. But, and I'm not saying I live perfectly by the word. I mean, anybody that knows me, if you're in my Monday night small group, you know good and well, <laughs> well that's not true because I have all my flaws and all my issues just like anybody else. But I try. Um, but I can tell you that I have fun, um, I have joy, I um, have a good time, and I don't miss out on worldly things. I don't miss out on a worldly lifestyle. I have good friends. I mean, uh, Wednesday night, our um, Wednesday night small group met out at the beach. We had pizza, we ate, we chatted, um, we prayed for each other. Um, and it was, I mean, we had a great time. It was really hazy. It was a crazy night. It was real foggy. It was weird. Um, but we had such a good time. And like the world would look at that and maybe not look like that was such a good time. But man, we have such a great community and we care for each other. And it really is fun. And, and when you're living by the world standards, that maybe doesn't look that way, but when you're experiencing it, it is so much different, you know, and the world standards may say like, I've got to make this much money or I've got to go out partying or I've got to go do this and I've got to go do that. And when you're living by God's standards of like loving your neighbor, like in Matthew, that's a whole different ball game and be compassionate, you know, love one another help out the poor, you know, all those things. Like, those are things that, like, bring joy to your life that you don't understand until you experience it. So another thing that can close off our heart to God's love is living in unforgiveness. And I know, you know, like, we've talked about this a lot at church. Um, you know, like, when we're living in unforgiveness, like, it, it is, and I have lived in it for years in one situation, and it just eats your lunch. And I can just tell you that. And it will definitely keep you closed off. And it, and talking about putting some bricks up, it, I built an entire wall of china in, with mine. So um, it took a sledgehammer to take mine down. But boy, when it came down, it was amazing. I mean, talking about a relief, whew, it was amazing. And it came down. And this is the, this is, I love God's economy because it, the years that it took to build the wall up, do you know how long it took it to come down? One second. One second for it to come down. One moment with the Lord for it to come down. And it was gone. One moment of forgiveness and it was gone. And that joy and the peace was overflowing and it was done. And His love that was always there, but I had just held it back, was just lavished on me at one moment. So anyway, so good. And then sometimes we, um, we shut down because we're afraid of what he might ask us to do or what we might feel. Um, you know, if, if we're, we don't want to approach him because we're afraid he might go ask us to go into the mission field or he might ask us to change jobs or he might ask us to give something to somebody we don't want to give them. And we're like, well, I'm not going to go up there because he's going to ask me to do this. Um, but you know what? If he's asked you to do something, he's going to prepare the way. So it's all good. You know, you just keep going to the Father. He's going it, to, it's really okay. Um, and, or what we want to, might feel, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, you know, I, at least at staff one day I mentioned this, like sometimes in worship, you know, like I have to just like, I'll stop because I'm afraid if I continue, I'm just going to like lose it. And because, you know, I, the presence of the Lord is just like right there. And I'm like, I don't, I don't want to cry in front of everybody. I don't want to be emotional. And so it's, it's like, but he's there like right waiting for me and just ready to love on me. And um, it, this reminds me, and I asked Jane if I could share this with you. Um, most of y'all know, like, she went to Wells to be with uh, Ken and Jen 
for five weeks in October of this past year. And she did great. I mean, like, I was a little worried, you know, because, you know, when your 15 year old goes to uh, another country for five weeks without, you know, her parents. And we're pretty close. We hang out a lot. And she's homeschooled, so she's with me all day. And, you know, I was worried about her being homesick and, and whatever. But, you know, she was great. She is nannying the, uh, you know, the kids. They went to um, London while Ken and Jen were at a conference. And she kept the kids and she babysit. And she had to keep up with her school while she was there and whatever. And, you know, she, she was like, man, I could stay longer. She was doing great. Didn't get homesick. And when she arrived, she came around the corner of the terminal and she saw me and then and Mark was behind me. And she took off running and she came to me and she wrapped her arms around me and she just kind of collapsed and became a little emotional. And it was like, it was like, I, you know, she did, I think it was like, I don't, I didn't realize I missed you until I approached you, until I, until I fell into your arms. And don't you think maybe that's kind of how it might be with God? Like, until we, like, follow that commandment in Matthew and love him with all our heart, soul, and mind and approach him and fall into his arms and let his, him lavish that love on us and we fall into him that we're going to realize how much we missed him, how much we needed him, how much we wanted him. I think it's one of those things like we don't know until we experience it. We can't say like if you've never had chocolate ice cream, which I love chocolate ice cream. I'm sure y'all would probably think of something better than that. But just for an example, you know, I can't say how much I love chocolate ice cream. I've never had it. Until you've experienced God's love, you don't know. You've got to, but you've got to approach him. You've got to get all the bricks out of the way. You've got to realize there's a need for it. So first, you've got to get the bricks out of the way if you've got any. You may not have any, but if you've got any, you've got to get the bricks out of the way. Then you've got to see there's a need for it. You've got to, you've got to say, okay, I'm not self-sufficient. I need my Father. You've got to follow the command in Matthew. It's not a suggestion. It is a command. It's an action on your part. You've got to go to the Father. Or we do. I'm included in this. I'm sorry I'm saying you. We. You've got to go to the Father. And, and, and you've got to lavish that love on Him. And He's going to lavish that love back on you. And then, you know, this morning I had the, the honor to go to um, Carissa's um, business over at Tusk. She had a, a prayer and worship time, and it was just a really cool moment of just praying and worshiping together. And this came up a lot, like God's love, God's love. But and and when towards the end, it just kind of came to me because I'd already planned on teaching on this. But then it was like it like took it to another level. Like, why is this so important? Because God's, you know, is this a selfish thing for me, like to want to experience God's love? But the thing about it is like when we're like overflowing with God's love, it radiates out to those around us. And that's where like others catch it. Like when we're carrying his presence, others get it. When we are um, overflowing with his love, like we want to share it. Like we want to show that to the other people. We want to pray for others. We want to say, Hey, do you, do you know about this guy? You know, let me show you what he did for my life. So, yeah, we might be going for a little bit of selfish mo- motives to be able to f- experience his love and his presence, but we also get to take that and share it with others and um, be able to, you know, bring that uh, revival to our city, to our community, to our neighborhood, to our next door neighbors that they need. So, um, that's the that's the tangible applicable moment is like not what we get from it but what we get to share with others around us so anyway i'm going to wrap up here um what i uh, i want you guys to do in gather group this morning is to um 
kind of take a moment and explore first if you have any bricks that you've constructed um, that are keeping you from God's love, um, or if you're simply just not even approaching Him to to see um, if you know that you're not receiving from Him. Um, just remember that scripture, Matthew, that we're to love Him with our heart, soul, and mind. Um, if we're not doing that, like why? What's what's the why there? Um, and and just remember, like the fish the, about the the horse and the trough like he, it's there it's free we are to, we are we have the ability to come and drink freely we have the ability you know to come to the father and for it to be lavished upon us so anyway um thanks for letting me share with you guys this morning um have take some time to to share with each other and i hope you have a great week Next week, we'll be back in the church building, and Mark and the team will be back on late Friday night, so be sure to be praying for them this week, and we'll see you guys next Sunday. Thanks.